and the Oscar goes to Roma. So here's a thought. Whether you like it or not, the Oscars are the biggest event in film industry to happen every year. And it's a pretty good thing that it exists. Think about it. Despite the arbitrary idea of choosing the best picture or best director or who gave the best performance, which of course you cannot do because you cannot measure those things, the Oscars are still very much so a very worthy award. And here's how this year's nominees can help us understand why. First things first. If not for an Oscar nomination, how many people would have actually watched a documentary about a group of Romanian journalists unveiling a major corruption scheme in Bucharest's health system that directly caused the death of dozens of patients? It's only because Collective got nominated for an Oscar that I'm even talking about the movie in this video. A movie, by the way, that is my favorite among the five nominated for Best Documentary, although I'm certain that the award will go to Garrett Bradley's time. Furthermore, would a movie like Quo Vadis Aida have reached the same number of people and screens that it has if not for its nomination as Best International Picture? Now, a powerful, urgent and cautionary drama about the Bosnian War and the horrors perpetrated against the Bosnian people has made its way into a greater number of viewers than it would have originally, if not for the Oscars. And also here, in this category, of course, I'm cheering for the underdog. Given that Thomas Winterberg's Danish drama Another Round will be taking home the prize, even though it's not as good of a movie or as memorable as Quo Vadis Aida. Even though the ending with the dancing scene is a very powerful and cathartic moment, maybe even one of the most beautiful endings I've seen in a long time. Anyway, such examples of movies getting recognized because of the Oscars can go on and on year after year. Small, local and indie movies, one after the other, reaching bigger audiences because of their nominations. And that is a very good thing. Just think of Juno, Whiplash, 21 Grams, Monster, Lost in Translation, Moonlight. Moonlight, you guys won Best Picture. Of course, this is still a game for the big players and the big studios. And that's why we have so many undeserving, bad, awful movies getting recognized. Ah, here's looking at you, Green Book. When you laugh, laugh. Yeah, I'm laughing all right. Anyway, beyond all of that comes Oscar season. Every year the ceremony generates great debate over representativity in movies and in the stories that are told. And I do believe that this year the Academy has done a better job in recognizing non-white and women artists. With all of that being said, I do believe that Richard Brody's recent column in The New Yorker does well in affirming that although this year's awards don't reach the same lows that last year's did, where the likes of Ford vs Ferrari in 1917 got the nomination for Best Picture, they also don't reach the same highs, with not a single movie achieving the same level of Parasite's masterful storytelling. So without further ado, let's take a look at this year's nominees for Best Picture. Working our way to the top, I think that we should start the list with The Sound of Metal, which I find might be the weakest of the bunch. Don't get me wrong, I don't think this is a bad movie at all. In fact, I find it better than the next movie in this list. But I've had a major problem with this movie in the sense that it was the only one that had me bored for some moments. In spite of that, I really like the main character's arc here. We have this guy whose main connection to the world is his music. Hearing it and making it, in many ways, music is presented as more than just his passion. It's his means of experiencing life. A characteristic that is brilliantly summed up in the scene where he wakes up his girlfriend by touching her with his drumsticks. As with everything around him, his connection with his girlfriend is also mediated by the music they make together. So the idea behind the plot that for this guy to lose his hearing is to lose his connection with the world is very well explored. Director Darius Marder does a great job in building this anxious and desperate feeling from a man who's becoming alienated from the world. The sound editing here especially makes up for a claustrophobic experience, as if the protagonist's sudden impairment could afflict us in the audience as well. From the get-go, the plotline draws us, as we look forward to seeing where this problem will lead with Ahmed's character. Ahmed, who, by the way, gives a solid performance as his is the face of desperation and loss through most of this picture. The third act, 
ending on a high note after the nightmare our lead has been through is also worthy of notice. The problem with this movie lies on its second act, where the script fails to push the story forward at countless moments, making for some pretty boring scenes that are only rescued by some great acting from Ahmed and the outstanding, remarkably good Paul Rassi. While The Sound of Metal has been nominated for seven Oscars, including Best Screenplay, Best Actor for Riz Ahmed, and Best Supporting Actor for Paul Rassi, I believe it is only deserving of winning Best Sound and Best Supporting Actor, although it's a tough one for Rossi, seen as he's up there against the favorite and great Daniel Kaluuya from Judas and the Black Messiah. All in all, I give this movie a 7 out of 10. Now, on to the next picture. The one thing I can say about The Trial of the Chicago 7 is that it's a fun movie. As is the case with most of Aaron Sorkin's screenplays, I had a good time watching it. The story captivated me, I was invested in each and every character's arc, even though they are never fully explored with much emotional depth. And because of its big ensemble, Sorkin is clever enough to make a protagonist out of three of the characters from the cast. Having John Carroll Lynch, Sasha Baron Cohen and Eddie Redmayne's characters as three opposing forces inside of a single unit with a common goal keeps us on the edge of our seats through most of the time. Sorkin's screenplay is very effective in establishing three strong and different personalities that have to argue to make their point come across. Throughout the movie, they are constantly forced to compromise in order to achieve the thing that really matters. And in the process of doing so, they disarm themselves against each other. As the story moves forward, closing in the third act, the initial animosity that permeated the group dissolves as they fight the common enemy of an unjust, biased and morally corrupt system embodied by the judge portrayed by Frank Lagella. The real problem with this movie is that it's way too easy to draw a comparison with, let's say, the Avengers saga. You think this is funny? The first act is like the first Avengers movie, where you have those different characters coming from different backgrounds, uniting and working through their differences to achieve a common goal. By the second act, you have something similar to Captain America Civil War, where their differences are too great to keep them together and so the fights inside the group escalate to the point of threatening the unity that the world or America needs them to be. And by the third act, they realize that the threat of an unjust and oppressive system is too big and that they must work through those differences in order to beat this evil, malicious threat. Just in the same way that Captain America and Iron Man reunite in Infinity War to beat Thanos. Now, plot by plot comparison wouldn't be enough to bring the trial of the Chicago 7 down to the same level of the Avengers saga, in terms of not having something serious and of substance to say. The real thing that accomplishes such a downgrade is how easily Aaron Sorkin's directing and screenplay give in to melodramatic tones, opting for shallow character development and stereotypical representations instead of really digging into those characters, which you can do even with a big ensemble, as proven by Judas and the Black Messiah. Furthermore, the melodramatic tones escalate with a score that promotes moments like this. That's Corporal Robert Earl Ellis, 19 years old. Ugh. All in all, here's a fun watch and also a cheap movie. The only one that didn't deserve the nomination for Best Picture. I'm still gonna give it a 7 out of 10 though for keeping me entertained. Although Sasha Baron Cohen's nomination for Best Supporting Actor is laughable. Even more so when you consider that the Roy Lindo's performance in The Five Bloods didn't make the list. Well, moving on, the next movie on this list is the boldest choice the Academy has made this year. Emerald Fennell's Promising Young Woman occupies the same place in the Best Picture category that could have easily been occupied by three other great movies, Shiva Baby, Kajillionaire and The Five Bloods. I mean that in the sense that none of those movies would be obvious choices for the Academy to make, and that's exactly why all four of them should have made the list. But I'm happy enough that at least one has made it, especially one with a wonderful leading lady. Anyway, for as long as mankind has been telling stories, it has been telling stories of vengeance. And here's one with many twists and turns and a strong motive, undertoned by the urgency of addressing women's abuse in today's society. I really love the way the score here sets the tone for the movie in a sort of dark comedy slash thriller slash ironic way and also pushes the story forward without sounding condescending to a narrative that can properly stand on its own two feet. The cinematography and the production design are also very effective in guaranteeing that this movie has a lot of soul and style. The fact that Carrie Mulligan gives the performance of her career only elevates the movie and sets the bar higher for director Emerald Fennell not to let such a performance go to waste, which she definitely doesn't. It would be easy for this protagonist to fall into flat notes if she had shallow reasons for doing what she does. 
but a strong script guarantees that Mulligan has plenty of layers of emotion and motives to work with. I do feel that the element of surprise in the third act of the script makes for a better viewing in a first watch than in a second time around, but in spite of that, or because I haven't watched it a second time yet, I'm gonna give it a 7.5 out of 10. It could definitely be a higher grade if, at moments, I hadn't felt like this movie could be an episode of Black Mirror. Next up is Minari. Here's a very humble, modest and unpretentious movie that accomplishes so much by doing the simplest of things, which is to portray the life and the relationships of a family living in a specific context. In this case, the portrayal of a first-generation Korean-American family living in rural Arkansas as the father works restlessly in building their farm as a way to prosper is both a tale of a brother-American dream, one that encompasses not only white Americans but all of them, whether white, black, Latino or Asian, and it's also a tale about family, in every sense of the word. Through the many hardships they face as a family, while braving through a new world that the parents came all the way from Korea to conquer, the movie offers them redemption through union, through staying true to their roots, and through love. Cheesy as it may sound, it's good, it works here. The best part of this movie has got to be the relationship between the grandma and the little boy. At her arrival they seem like a dog and a cat, she trying her best to be gentle, kind and loving towards him, while he himself, already born and raised in the United States, finds her odd in every possible way, from the way she talks to the things she eats, and to the way she smells in his words too much like Korea. Of course, their relationship builds into something really special as the movie progresses, and it all transpires in such a natural way that director Lee Isaac Chung's work seems effortless. In many ways it feels like we're inside the life of a real family, and we come to care deeply about all of them. So much so that every blow they take falls heavily upon the audience. And believe me, that is not an easy thing to accomplish in a movie. And here's a script, a director, and especially a cast who pull it off. I gotta say, this is not my favorite movie nominated, and I also don't see it as a favorite to win Best Picture, but I wouldn't be disappointed if I did. It would be well deserved and it would also be an important statement in a moment that is much needed. From its simplicity to the powerful things it evokes, Minari is well deserving of an 8 out of 10. Now at fourth place on the list we have David Fincher's latest feature film, Mank, and you can never go wrong with a Fincher movie. At the very least you know his movie is bound to be well and purposefully shot in the sense that every single camera angle and movement, as well as the blocking and the editing and the sound design, they will all be serving the story that has been told, and that's a given fact in any of his movies. The real catch in this one is how he's able to emulate and play around with the aesthetic of the 40s without falling into the trap of enjoying such aesthetics too much to the point of losing sight of the content of the movie, something that tends to happen a lot with some directors. Right? Tarantino? Wes Anderson? Anybody? <laughs> anyway, Fincher is working here with a script his father wrote back in the 90s. It tells us the tale of the old Hollywood by telling the story of how Herman Mankiewicz came to write the script for Citizen Kane. In many ways I feel this is a movie that Hollywood didn't know it needed to feel part of its historiography until it came to be, and I also think it'll have a special place in cinema's history as one of those pieces of work where the industry is able to self-evaluate and look at its past critically while still having something of relevance to say about today. The whole plot surrounding the election for governor, where the big studios and the big producers and media owners work to vilify Upton Sinclair's candidacy as if socialism was the work of the devil in order to guarantee their own selfish interests above the people's needs is very pertinent even today, maybe today more than ever. Also, Fincher is able to avoid the empty naiveness so common with movies that revisit old Hollywood, like The Artist, for example. Obey not being a cynical nor a cold-hearted man, Fincher sometimes revisits this past through a romantic and nostalgic lens. You can definitely be transported by the nostalgia with the ambience created. The sound design created by Ren Kleiss uses technology to emulate the sound of old Hollywood pictures. And the acting too evokes the way women and men used to behave, act and talk. Props for the great work done here by the whole ensemble, especially Gary Oldman and Amanda Seyfried, both nominated, though none is likely to win. The script does stall a bit in the first act, but once the story evolves and we start to understand and revisit through flashbacks the things and people that inspired Mank in the writing of Citizen Kane, the whole thing becomes very interesting. By modeling itself after one of the greatest classics of all time, of course I'm talking about Citizen Kane, Mank might just become a classic of its own. If Orson Welles was the greatest American director of his time, Fincher certainly belongs amongst the greatest of his. Here's an 8.5 out of 10.
Coming up in third place is The Father, a picture I went to watch with very low expectations. Knowing nothing beforehand, I thought it'd be one of those movies that only manages to get Oscar buzz because of a stellar cast, and boy was I wrong. Let's just say before anything else that this movie immediately hits my soft spot for movies adapted from theater plays. When well done, those single set, dialogue based, stage acted movies hit home for me. Carnage, Fences, Marini's Black Bottom, Glen Gary Glenn Ross, to name a few, they all have a special place in my heart. And now the father comes up strong to join the list. The best word to describe this picture would be disorienting. As we follow a few days, weeks, or months in the life of an old man in an advanced stage of dementia, we are put inside his tormented and confused mind. As his surroundings and the people around him seem to change completely from one second to the other, we fail to grasp and understand what is going on. In the first act of the movie, when you haven't yet started to make sense of what is happening, you are forcefully putting this man's shoes. And let me tell you one thing, it is desperate. Throughout the movie, a very effective and confident direction from Florian Zeller, in his directorial debut, guarantees that the audience is made to feel lost, confused and, of course, disoriented. Florian, who wrote the original play, transports the story from the stage to the screen making great use of cinema stills. The editing, the production design and the cinematography in the movie are one of the finest examples I've seen of techniques being used to move and to trouble the audience. As the sets in the movie seem to completely change out of nowhere, the editing too troubles us, going from one moment in time to a completely different moment in a matter of seconds. And so we are made to feel exactly like our protagonist feels. Also, the supporting cast in this movie does a great job in provoking our minds and confusing us but it's Anthony Hopkins' performance, the best of his career, that truly makes for an emotionally devastating and soul-wrecking film. If you were not for a deserving recognition of Chadwick Boseman's career after his sudden and tragic passing, Hopkins would be a lock for Best Actor. But it's a lock! No. And it would be a most deserving one. But regardless, here's an 8.5 out of 10. And our second place in this list is... Nomadland. Listen, this is a tough one that could have easily made it to the top of the list. I find this such a beautiful picture and such a touching portrayal of what life is for so many people in the present day in the United States. And it's a really tough decision between the work accomplished here by director Chloe Zhao and what Shaka King accomplished in Judas and the Black Messiah, with a little personal inclination to the latter. I gotta say, I usually have a harder time reviewing the films that I really enjoyed because those are the ones that tend to hit us on a much more sentimental and sensible way rather than in a logical level. What I mean is that they go for our soul and not our brains, making it harder to put into words what we think of them. I can easily tell you how I feel about this movie though, and man do I love it. I love how urgent it is how it touches such pressing issues, and how this story follows Francis McDormand's character, a modern-day nomad, in the same fashion a documentary might follow its subject, though there is too much dramaticity involved to really resemble a documentary. In many ways, this movie walks through the same grey area of fiction that Ken Loach's movies do, meaning that if not everything, most of what we see here is fiction, but there is so much of real life in it, invading the movie, permeating the narrative in the smallest of details, that you cannot help but feel like you are looking inside the life of a real person. Person. It's also worthy to remember that some of the brilliant people we see in this movie are non-actors, telling their real-life story as nomads. Listen, all in all I deny the idea that suggests that this movie talks about the failure of the American dream. Those people's lives are not failures. That's the main point that comes across this movie. What they are is a community, living their lives outside the limiting and poor idea of an American dream. What did happen instead is that America has failed them. Here's the backbone of America's modern day economy. People who are either pushed out of their homes and have to make do with what they got in order to survive, going from place to place after temporary and seasonal jobs, or people who find themselves better fulfilled amongst the love and companionship they find living in those communities, rather than in the alienating hardship of everyday blue collar work. I have so much more to say about this movie, but I still gotta watch it countless times before I'm able to start grasping all of the things that it has to say and to offer. For now I can only tell you to go watch it as soon as you can. If nothing else, it'll give you a better understanding of life and the way that we, as a society, chose to neglect the vast majority of people so that a few greedy companies could make a buck. For its urgency and its beauty, I'll give it a 9 out of 10. Oh, and also let's not forget that this is the movie that's gonna win Best Picture. Oh, and by the way, Francis McDormand is a force of nature. Deputy Chairman Fred Hampton of the Illinois Black Panther Party. Yep, we're finally here. My top movie in this list is none other than Shaka King's Judas and the Black Messiah. Boy, oh boy, what can I say? 
In so many ways, this movie feels like Scorsese meets Spike Lee. Yet it's so fresh and unique, not that the aforementioned directors aren't, but this feels new. It feels like an exciting first look into the career of a promising director who's got a lot to say. From the get-go, we're immediately drawn in by a prologue that sets the tone for what we are about to embark on, in terms of aesthetics, storytelling, character development, and filmmaking style. And let me clue you in, as soon as this prologue sets the premise for the whole plot by trapping one of our protagonists slash antagonist and forcing him into a very complicated position of having to become a rat among the Black Panther's party, we are hooked. Here's a story inspired by true events that are really stranger than fiction. Throughout its two hours of running time, what we witness is the absurd situations that the FBI and the American government created to dismantle, defame and destroy the Black Panther's movement and along with it, the lives of everyone associated with it. The way that the character of William O'Neill, brilliantly portrayed by Lakeith Stanfield, is pushed into working against the Black Panther's movement, having to come up with material proof and situations to incriminate the very people who are struggling hard in order to guarantee a decent life and a decent future for black people like himself, is yet another shameful chapter in the history of the United States. I can hardly think of a more fitting title for a movie that sees one of its characters actively work to incriminate and bring down the very person and leader who is doing his best to keep his people safe. If Fred Hampton, portrayed by the wonderful Daniel Kaluuya, is this narrative's messiah, then his is the path of self-sacrifice in the name of his followers. A sacrifice that is built slowly and steadily as the narrative progresses without a single wasted moment, perfectly balancing between two different plots, one of the political and social aspirations of the Panthers, and another of the deviated and morally corrupt institution of the FBI that work to extinguish the former. In the middle, William O'Neill appears as a conflicted and tormented character whose actions will alter the lives of many innocent people. By the end of the third act, as we witness the horrific events of a cold December night in 1969, we are left nauseated, disgusted and profoundly shocked. And if you don't already feel like that while living in the year of 2021, then you haven't been paying close attention. Here's a 9.5 out of 10, and although this movie will not win Best Picture, will still remain a relevant one for many times to come. Regardless, I'm happy enough that Nomadland will be taking home the prize, though if we have a surprise like Green Book in the form of the Chicago 7 this year, man, then you just have to forget about the Oscars. Yeah.